And before we jump back into unit 17, there's a couple things I wanna do. Uh, we are gonna Kahoot in just a second. So, um, but before we Kahoot, I just, y'all put your pencils down for a second. I wanna have a conversation. Um, not that I think you're gonna be tested on it, but so much better for you to have a better understanding of the, of the concept of how it works. So we've talked about, uh, in unit 21, we talked about interim interest. And remember we said interim interest is just the buyer getting caught up on their interest payment. So why don't you guys remind me in the chat, if we were going to closing today, today being February 17th, if we were to go to closing today, when would the buyer's first mortgage payment be due? We go to closing today, happy closing day. When is the buyer's first mortgage payment gonna be due? So we go to closing today with, with the buyer originating a new loan. We go to closing today. They originate their loan today. Skip the first first. So there is no mortgage payment on March 1st. The buyer's first mortgage payment is going to be April 1st. And when they make that mortgage payment on April 1st, they're paying March's interest. So what interim interest does when the buyer originates a new loan, is it gets the borrower caught up on their interest payment. The lender is going to charge them for interest from today to the end of the month. In pre-licensing world, that's February 30th. So however many days that is, count it out on your fingers, however many days that is, there would be a charge for interim interest, a debit to the buyer at settlement for that many days of interest. They've paid interest through the end of February. Now they don't have a payment in March. They make that first payment on April 1st and it covers March's interest. That's when the buyer originates a new loan. Everybody good with that? A little refresher for you. That's interim interest. There's some other interest scenarios that, again, I don't think you're going to be tested on, but I think it's important that we have an understanding in case you're ever asked these questions or put in this situation. So let's talk about some other interest scenarios. And let's talk, for example, about the seller's loan. The seller has a loan as well, presumably, not unless they've paid it off or they were a cash buyer. If we were to go to closing today, the seller's done with their loan today. Everybody good with that? They're going to pay it off today. They're going to record a deed of release and that loan is taken care of. So on, Mar on uh, February 1st, the seller would have made a mortgage payment and when they make that mortgage payment in February, they're paying January's interest because interest is always paid in arrears. We go to closing today, the seller's not around to make a mortgage payment. The seller doesn't have a mortgage payment on March 1st, do they? Because they closed the loan today. So part of the seller's loans, seller's payoff amount is going to include interest for the first 17 days of February. Part of the thing that the attorney and the seller's mortgage company does is figure out how much the seller owes on their mortgage to the day of closing. And that has to include interest for however many days that month. Now the seller's not gonna write a check for interest, right? It's all gonna be calculated in their bottom line. My homeowner's in here. You know, once a month you get your mortgage statement and they give you an approximate balance. And then there's an asterisk and you follow that asterisk down to the bottom of the page. And it says, this is not a payoff amount. Call the mortgage company for a payoff amount because part of the payoff amount has to include these 17 days of interest that the lender is gonna wanna collect at settlement. Questions on that, comments on that? It could, similar to the car loan, yeah, any loan, anything that you owe interest on, the whomever's 
holding the interest is going to want to collect while the loan is still outstanding. So the loan is outstanding until today where it's settled today, where it, where, where it ends today. So that's what the sellers look like. Again, they're not writing the lender a check, but it's all part of there. And they have to calculate if the seller has any money left in escrow, they need to take that into consideration. That's going to be credited back to the seller. That escrow money just doesn't go. A uh, question came in, do both parties pay interest on 217? Yeah, because we're talking about two different lenders, two different loans. The seller has their loan, the buyer has their loan, right? Two totally separate things. So the seller will pay interest on their loan for the day of closing and the buyer will pay interest on their loan for the day of closing. The other scenario that we kind of touched on, make sure we're good on. Again, let's pretend we go to closing today. The other scenario to consider, no, that's not right is if the buyer assumes the seller's mortgage. If the buyer assumes the seller's mortgage, they're not originating a new loan. If the buyer assumes the seller's mortgage, they're picking up on those loan payments where the seller left off. So the seller makes the mortgage payment on February 1st, which covers January's interest. We go to closing today, the property changes hands, and on March 1st, the buyer makes the payment. We don't skip a beat. They've assumed the loan. When the buyer makes the payment on March 1st, they're paying February's interest. Is that fair for the buyer to be responsible for the entire month of February's interest? Should the buyer have to pay the whole month? Did they own the property the whole month? And the answer I see you guys shaking your head is no. So what does that mean? We have to prorate. February's interest. The buyer will pay the whole month. So stop and ask yourself who owes whom. And in this case, the answer is the seller owes the buyer for the period of time that they own the property. So when we assume, when the buyer assumes the loan, we're going to prorate that month's interest because it's not fair to make the buyer to pay the whole month. So at settlement, it would show up as a debit the seller, credit the buyer for those first 17 days. Buyer assuming the seller's mortgage versus the buyer originating their own loan. Good morning. Questions on that, comments? Get your wheels turning this morning. Oh, goodness. Questions, comments? Again, interim interest. I guarantee you, you're going to see interim interest. Okay. All right, let's go hoop. Y'all get your phones out. This Kahoot. Um, oh, real quick dates, since I have this up anyway. March 8th is your final. March 11th is the retake. If you don't have these written down yet, please write them down. March 8th is the final. March 11th is the retake. All right, now we can kahoot. No, I just showed you guys the answers. <laughs> Giving away kahoot answers. So either go into the website, kahoot.it, or you go and get in your app. If you're doing the website of the app, you do 849-6990, or you can scan the QR code. This Kahoot is on units 14, 15, and 21. So this is our financing Kahoot and our closing Kahoot. Financing and Kahoot and closing.
Give me a few more seconds if you want to play. If you don't want to play on your phone, you can play. Play in your head. Okay, everybody in that wants to play? Everybody good? All right. All right, let's go. 14, 15, and 21. <clears throat> Question number one, a mortgage loan can have its lien <clears throat> priority lowered through the use of a ten seconds. Mortgage loan can have its lien priority lowered through a subordination agreement. Remember, if you subordinate, you place yourself in a lower ranking. So we talked about your first mortgage is your senior mortgage. All mortgages after that are your junior mortgage. <clears throat> if you want to refinance your senior mortgage, they're not going to agree to do it unless the junior mortgage agrees to subordinate. Remember, it's all about uh, mortgage priority or lien priority who gets paid first they get paid in the order in which they're recorded right so your senior mortgage happens first the day you uh purchase the home somewhere down the road you get another loan on your property so now you have a junior mortgage who's getting paid first who's getting paid first the senior mortgage right because they recorded first you go and ask the senior mortgage to refinance. And when you refinance, they have to re record the new information. Now they're recording after the junior mortgage. Now who gets paid first? The junior mortgage gets paid first. Does the senior mortgage like this? No. So the only way a senior mortgage will agree to subordinate or the senior group. The only way a senior mortgage will agree to refinance is if the junior mortgage agrees to subordinate. If they subordinate, then they're saying, telling the senior mortgage, okay, you can still get paid first. I'm gonna place myself in a lower ranking. The acceleration clause is one of the provisions of our promissory note. The acceleration clause accelerates when the mortgage is due, when the note is due. So for example, in the event of default, if you default on your mortgage, the acceleration clause will kick in and they will demand the whole note due. They've accelerated when it's due. Satisfaction, satisfaction of mortgage, that's what we get up and go to work for every day. Satisfaction of mortgage means you paid that thing off. You've satisfied the mortgage, deed of release. And then hypothecation agreement, um, that's the pledge you take. Basically, I will pay you back your pledge to the lender. Questions on this one? Okay, let's see what we got. Gracie. Got it right first, Amin, Brooklyn, Jolie, and Valen. Top five out the gate. Question number two, the right a borrower has to regain the property ownership by paying the debt after a foreclosure sale is called? Ten seconds. Good job, guys. You're redeeming yourself. Remember redemption. You're saving yourself. What are you saving yourself from? Foreclosure. So you have 
uh, different redemption periods. North Carolina, our redemption period is a statutory redemption period, which happens after the foreclosure sale. So the redemption period, you're saving yourself from foreclosure. Gracie Lee staying on top, Jolie crept up, Amin, Valen, and Bob. Question number three, the main purpose of a mortgage is to Nine seconds. The main purpose of a mortgage is to provide security for the loan. Security for who? Security for the lender. It's the security that the lender has in the event of the borrower's default. It does create a lien on the property. It does, but that's not its main purpose. A mortgage main goal is not to create a lien, is to provide security for the loan. It's the collateral that the lender has in the event of the borrower's default. The deed, well, the promissory note, because the lender does have um, legal title, but the promissory note gives them that until that uh, loan is paid off. Questions on this one? So we've got Joe Lee, Amina, Valen, Bob, and Gracie Lee. Those five are just changing places around. Uh, Alex is our highest climber at 15 places. Question number four, Fannie Mae. Ten seconds. Fannie Mae buys FHA loans. Fannie Mae is a player on the secondary mortgage market. Remember, the secondary mortgage market purchases loans from the primary mortgage market. The primary mortgage market is who originates loans. That's who you and I talk to. When you want money, you're talking to a player on the primary market. Once the loan originates, they may sell it to Fannie, Freddie, or Jenny. Questions on this one? So we got Valen, Angela, Jolie, Amin, and Star came up. Um, three of you, combo breaker, three players just dropped their answer streak of three. Okay. It's like three of you are on fire. That's how I'm interpreting that. I'm going by what the picture says. <laughs> Question number five, a mortgage loan that is secured by both real and personal property, real property and personal property. Ten seconds. Mortgage loan is secured by both is your package mortgage. The package mortgage combines the purchase of real property and personal property. The blanket mortgage is a loan for when you're purchasing more than one parcel of land. When you're buying multiple parcels, I think about, for example, a developer. Maybe they're buying multiple parcels so they can subdivide them. They're buying that land using a blanket mortgage. 
Our bridge loan is a short term loan, like a week maybe. A bridge loan, think about what a bridge does. A bridge loan fills the gap between the end of one loan and the beginning of another. Maybe you have a period of time. And then purchase money mortgage is seller financing. Purchase money mortgage is seller financing. Questions on this one? So we got six of you on fire. Mendy just came out of nowhere. Gracie Lee's hanging on. Valen, Destiny popped up. And Bob's still hanging on. Question number six. At settlement, commission generally appears as a... Ten seconds. At settlement, commission is a debit to the seller. Seller is typically responsible for commission. Remember CDE, commission, deed preparation fee, and excise tax. <clears throat> so typically, the seller is responsible for, for commission, which means it will be a debit to the seller. Questions on this one? So we got Mindy, Val, and Bob. Sarah and Renee crept up. Melissa's our highest climber this round. She's up eight places. And I think our last one, which of the following items is not prorated between buyer and seller at settlement? Ten seconds. Answer that in just a second. The recording fees. The seller's responsible for paying their recording fees. The buyer's responsible for paying their recording fees. We're not going to prorate those amounts. So things that we typically prorate between settlement are this year's property taxes, HOA dues, and rent. Remember, for prorate, we're 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 splitting a shared expense. We're taking a shared expense such as HOA dues on February 17th for the month of February. Questions on this one. I had a question come in for the seller. The seller is responsible for paying commission, the deed preparation fee, deed preparation fee, and excise tax, CDE. All right, we ready for the big reveal? I love the dramatic conclusion of Kahoot. Our podium winners are third place, we have Bob, good job. Second place is Valen, good job. And our winner of this Kahoot is Mindy. I got runners up of Sarah and Angela, fourth and fifth place. Questions? All right, so let's get back into unit 17. We started 17 the other day, so we're going to do a real quick refresher of the, the couple slides that we got covered. Uh, one of the things we did was define what an appraisal was, uh, put a definition on it. And guys, remember, an appraisal 
is just the appraiser's opinion of value. They're studying the subject property, which we're going to talk more about, the different ways that they can study the subject property. And based on their findings, they're going to give their opinion of value. Could two different appraisers offer two different opinions? Absolutely. Just because the appraiser gives their opinion of value, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what a buyer is willing to pay for it. The appraisal is just an opinion. Who actually drives the market, who actually determines what they're going to pay for that property is the buyer. The buyers drive the market. So just because an appraiser says, I think this property's value is X amount, that means nothing if you don't have a buyer willing to pay that amount. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody good to that? So we defined an appraisal. We also defined our role. Now we're gonna talk more about CMAs and BPOs, but the point that we need to get across early on Real estate agents do CMAs and BPOs. The appraiser does an appraisal. The appraiser can give their opinion on value. We are not an appraiser, unless you are, of course. I cannot give my opinion on value because I'm not an appraiser. As a real estate agent, my CMA gives you opinion on probable sales price or probable lease price. If you're not an appraiser, Take the word value out of your vocabulary. You look at the seller and say, based on my CMA, I think your probable sales price is da da da. We're going to talk more about CMAs and BPOs <clears throat> in just a bit. And then the last thing we said is that provisional brokers cannot do a BPO for a fee. You cannot charge a fee as a provisional broker. You can do a BPO but you can't charge a fee for it. Only non-provisional brokers can do a BPO for a fee. And nobody, I don't care who you are, provisional broker, broker, or broker in charge, nobody can charge a seller or a buyer to do a CMA as part of your general brokerage services. That's part of our job. When you're going to that listing appointment, you do a CMA because the seller's gonna look at you at some point and say, what do you think I can sell my house for? You're not going to say, well, I'll tell you what, if you give me $300, I'll answer that question. That's just part of our job. Same thing with the buyers. When your buyer says, oh my gosh, this is the dream house. This is what I've been looking for. Let's write it up. How much do you think I should offer? Well, I'll give you my opinion if you give me $500. We cannot do that. It's part of my job. Everybody with me? It's part of my job, my general broker services to do CMA for buyers and sellers. So this is where we ended. It's Tuesday. So let's talk more about value. Let's talk about what value means. Guys, remember, unless we're talking about CMAs or BPOs in this unit, we got our appraiser's hat on. So we're gonna get off of CMAs for a minute. We'll come back to them. So put your appraiser's hat back on and let's define value. There are certain characteristics that help define value. In order to have value, you have to have dust. Value is just the relationship between an item desired and a potential buyer. Remember the buyer is the consumer. It doesn't matter if they're buying a house or if they're buying a candy bar. They're still the consumer. Don't let the price tag throw you off. They're still the consumer that's purchasing. And one thing the appraiser is going to look at when offering their opinion of value is dust. Is there a demand for the property? Is there a need or a desire for the property? That need or desire has to be backed by the financial needs to purchase it. What's the utility of the property? How's it going to satisfy the future owner's needs and desires? Sometimes you come across a property, if you, if you read the description, it's like custom built this and custom built that, and the whole house was custom built. Was that custom built for the next owner? No, it was custom built for the current owner, right? And the appraiser needs to ask, how's that custom build 
going to affect the future owners? What's the utility for future owners? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, scarcity. Land is scarce. We only have so much land to go around. Think of, for example, uh, waterfront properties. Think of our down at our coast. You want beachfront property, you're going to pay for it because there's only so many properties we can run up and down the coast. There's only so many properties we can put around the lake. So what's the scarcity of the property? And then the ease of transferability. Is the current owner able to, to transfer a clear title, marketable title? So defining some more words, market value is the most probable price a property will bring. And a competitive and open market under all conditions requisite to a fair sale. Does probable mean that's what a buyer is willing to pay for it? No, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Multiple people could have different opinions on that probable price. It's not a guarantee. It's a guesstimate of what somebody would be willing to pay for it. And when we talk about requisite to a fair sale, um, we're saying each buyer and seller are in the transaction acting knowledgeably. They're acting without undue influence. So let's do some comparisons. Market value versus market price. Market value is the appraisal process. It's what the appraiser is putting their opinion on. They're giving their probable, their guesstimate. Market price is what somebody was actually willing to pay for it. Market price is the sold price. Let's compare market value to market cost. Again, market value is the appraisal process, the appraiser putting their opinion on it. Market cost is the money that was put into the property. Putting a new roof on the property is absolutely going to add value. Absolutely is going to add value. A brand new roof is more valuable than a 30-year-old roof. Everybody with me? If you put a brand new roof on a property, you're not going to be able to get 100% return. I think market cost, <clears throat> I think homeowner... I think homeowners out there sometimes think that they spent this money on this and they invested that and they invested this and they invested that. They're looking at their market cost. Think about the brand new roof as driving a brand new car off the lot. I've always heard when you drive a brand new car off the lot, as soon as it hits the street, it starts losing value, right? Same thing as the roof, the first storm that comes through, the first rain, the first sleet, the first sun that hits the roof. You're never going to get 100% return. I think the example in your book talks about installing a $15,000 pool. That doesn't mean you can increase the value of your property by $15,000. Guys, I'm all about homeowners doing what they want to do to their home while they're living there but they can't keep a tally sheet of what they do and expect to get that money back. I had a listing appointment a couple years ago. It was the sweetest couple. And um, I, really wanted to, I really wanted to help them. And we got to the point of the listing agreement where they said, uh, what do you think? What do you think we can get? And I said, well, based on my CMA, based on my research, I think your probable sales price is going to be between 95,000 and 100,000. And their faces sunk. I mean, just sunk. And they said, we were thinking like 135. We're way off here, aren't we? I'm at 100, they're at 135. And I said, okay, all right. I didn't get up and leave right then. I said, all right, share with me how you came up with that number. 
At that time, he handed me a piece of paper. That piece of paper listed the money they put in that property. We put in a new hot water heater. We fixed the deck. We did this. We did that. That's exactly what he was doing. He was taking the market value and adding the money he spent. I thanked him for that piece of paper. I told him, let me do some more research. I went back to the office. I asked my team leader for help. I'm like, look at these numbers with me, please. Because sometimes two sets of eyes are better than one. Two heads are better than one. And she looked at it with me and she said, Jules, she said, I just don't, we're just not going to be able to get them 135. The market won't support that. So I went back to him with my findings. I couldn't take that listing. I didn't feel in my heart of hearts that I could get them 135. And guys, let me tell you something. <laughs> I hate to lose a listing for whatever the reason. I hate to lose a listing. And whenever I lose a listing, I will stock that listing because I want to know who lists it and for how much. I will follow it. I followed that property for a couple months and nobody ever listed it. And I have a feeling all the agents that they talked to said, we just can't get you 135. Maybe in this market, it would have been a different story, but we weren't in this market yet. You can't just tack on the cost of past expenditures. Any questions or comments on that? I have a question. Um, yeah. What does the seller do in that case? A sell by owner? Maybe he went or, FISBO. I didn't, I didn't see it. I don't really look, follow FISBOs. Maybe they did go FISBO. Maybe they found a tenant. Maybe after talking to so many agents, they finally agreed to list it for, you know, 105 in the hopes to get 100. He can try to go for sale by owner. You don't have to take every listing, you guys. If you don't believe, this is, I don't know much about life. But one thing I do know is that the numbers don't lie. And when the numbers are looking at you saying that this home, this property, this value, this uh, probable sales price between 95 and 100, I can't make a buyer pay more than what they're willing to because that's what my seller wants. Um, question comes in about a pool adding value. That's really in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? Some people think a pool adds value. Other people will turn around and run away when they see a pool. So it's really in the eyes of the beholder, as is value. Value is in the eyes of the beholder. Hands down, the sellers put the most value in the property. Because to the sellers, this is their home. Blood, sweat, and tears went into this home. You remember when little Johnny fell right there and scraped his knee? I mean, there's memories, there's family, there's story, there's history. To the seller, it's a home. To everybody else in the world, it's just a house. So sellers naturally place more value in their home than anybody else, typically. That's right. I, I had a a, man, a a boss who actually gave a good analogy about selling and buying through windows where the buyer has a window, the seller has a window, and those windows are affected by price and location and what and all these other attributes, including a lot of things that they're just personal. And if the windows meet, then it's our job to try to make the sale. But if the windows are never going to meet, then there's just so much we can do about it. You know, I can't make a buyer pay more than what they're willing to pay. Bottom line, buyers decide if they're willing to pay it or not. Buyers are the one driving this market up. I see you guys, when we talk about this current market, and I tell you, you know, prices are being sold for $50,000 more than asking price. That's not the sellers. That's the buyers offering $50,000 more. You guys with me? The buyers are the one driving these prices up in this market. 
the sellers are advertising the home for a hundred thousand. The buyers say, well, I'll give you 150. They're the ones driving the market up. And you're right. If the two can't come together, then the two don't come together. There are different forces that influence value for the appraiser, different things that affect value, uh, social forces. Our trends in dynamics of the property are changing. Marriage and divorce rates are changing. Family size is changing. Longevity, how long we live is changing. Um, you're having dynamics where the adult kids are moving back home with mom and dad, or mom and dad are moving in with the adult kids. So you have several family units under one roof. Those social forces are trends, affect, influence, I should say value. Economic forces, when you have income and employment levels change. What happens to value when Amazon announced they were gonna open a warehouse and they were gonna bring on 200 more people? What does that do to the value of the market? There's a higher demand for it. It increases it, doesn't it? What if a factory announces they're gonna close their doors? Now values influenced by that the other way. Um, property taxes affect our economic forces. Current interest rates, that's what's going on right now. Interest rates are so dang low, buyers wanna take advantage of it. The problem is I don't have enough properties out there I don't have the inventory for all those buyers that want to take advantage of a low interest rate. Elections, specifically presidential elections. I, I see, I've been in the industry for 20 years. So how many presidential elections have I been through? Uh, however many that is. About the time of the election, real estate takes a pause. We slow down just a hair because the consumer wants to know the result of that election. And when the parties change sides, the buyers on the other side are now coming out of the woodwork. They've been sitting on their money for the last four to eight years. And now that their person is in place, they wanna come out and spend their money. Economics absolutely affects. Am I breaking up to you guys? Am I? No. So it might just, you may wanna, Log out, log back in. If you wanna wait till a minute till break, if you can get through to break. Uh, political forces, that's where I should have been talking about the election, sorry. <laughs> you guys are with me, right? We're, we're there. <laughs> um, other things other than elections, and that's not just presidential elections. We have elections for a new mayor, for a new governor, right? Local, all that can affect political forces. Um, zoning, zoning codes, building codes. And then environmental conditions and physical forces. Um, the location of the property. Isn't that the three most important things about real estate? Location, location, location. Public transportation, proximity to jobs, proximity to amenities. Do you have your favorite grocery store? You have your favorite you have your church, you have your place that you go to work. Proximity to jobs and amenities can affect value as well and the ease to get there. <laughs> your favorite bar. Isn't it just easier to live close to your favorite bar? <laughs> Proximity, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Starting on page 437, we're gonna define a bunch of words. Now these are appraisers words. We got them all listed for you on 437. We're gonna go through them. Highest and best use. This is a flashback from unit one. Let's go way back in time. Remember when we first met each other? We were in unit one, we mentioned highest and best use. And we said, we'll talk more about it later. Well, here we are. Highest and best use is the most profitable use for which a property is used. A property can only have one highest and best use at a time. That highest and best use can change as infrastructure changes, as cities grow and die. 
highest and best use can and does change, but you can only have one highest and best use at a time. Although you can use your property for whatever you want within the confines of zoning and covenants, the appraiser is always going to consider what that property's highest and best use is that property's use being maximized. The appraiser will always look at the highest and best use of a property and make sure that that's being maximized. The theory of substitution. Substitution says when a consumer has several items with essentially the same amenities, they're naturally gonna choose the least expensive of the two. If you're comparison shopping, you're looking at product A and product B, they're pretty similar. Substitution says we're gonna tend to go for the lower price one. Supply and demand, what's economics 101 say? When supply goes up, demand goes down. When demand goes up, supply goes down. It's your economic lesson for the day. Now in real estate, we don't talk about supply and demand. In real estate, we talk about seller's markets and buyer's markets. We are currently in a seller's market. Why are we in a seller's market? Because supply is really low and demand is really high. That pendulum will swing back and one day we'll be in a buyer's market. Buyer's market means demand is really low and supply is really high. Conformity. Conformity says that the maximum value has been realized when the property matches their surrounding areas, when the property conforms to its surroundings. Have you guys ever been on a, on a nice Sunday afternoon drive? You're out meandering around, two lane country road, radio up, windows down, makes me think of spring. And you're driving down this road and you see a nice little one-story brick ranch house after a one-story brick ranch house. You see this theme, these brick ranch houses down the road. And all of a sudden you round a corner and bam, there's this monstrosity up on the hill. And this sucker is like three stories. It's got a gate in it. Yeah, that house doesn't conform. I'm not saying it doesn't have value. Absolutely, it has value. I'm saying it doesn't conform. It doesn't match its surroundings. Anticipation, some future benefit or detriment is affecting the property. Maybe it's based off of a truth, maybe it's just a rumor, but there's something coming that we're anticipating. Where's my Kernersville people? How long have we been talking about that dang belt loop? I mean, I got to High Point in 2000, and they were talking about it then. That belt loop has been the anticipation of that area. We've been anticipating that thing coming. How uh, contribution, how the improvements contribute to the overall value of the property. Again, I'm all about a homeowner doing what they want to with their home while they own it. I'm all about it, go for it, it's your home. They need to understand that their improvements, their custom built this and custom built that may not contribute to the overall value of the property. Not all neighborhoods, for example, will support granite countertops. You wanna put granite countertops in, go nuts but understand it may not contribute. It may not add to the value of the neighborhood, the area doesn't support it. Uh, competition, think about a retail, think about commercial in a retail. The whole idea of retail centers, they wanna get you there. Once they're there, they wanna keep you and keep you spending money. Hopefully the competition is getting you there. Um, my Winston-Salem people are familiar with Thruway Shopping Center. If you go to Moe's for lunch today, what's Thruway want you to do? 
after you have lunch, they want you to go to that little kitchen gadget store. They want you to go to Rack Room Shoes, right? They want you to go to Dewey's and get a pink lemonade cake square. They want you to stay in throughway and spend more money. That's the idea of competition. Moe's got you there. The competitors are hoping you stay. And then change. Um, part of the appraiser's job is to study the past and predict the future. Know what the change is gonna be. And they study all things about the market. Are there big jobs coming or going? Is there infrastructure changing? All the things that can affect the future, the things that can change today that affect the future. Any questions on our appraiser's words? As an agent, Julie, do you think that um, also taste for a neighborhood might have to do with conformity as well? Like if, I don't know, the style, if someone has a house that just looks way too different. Sure. Sure, because it doesn't conform. You get like a modern looking house, like you get like a Jetsons house in the middle of a neighborhood that doesn't look like a Jetsons house. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, that, that may not confirm. You're going to have buyers that like that. Absolutely. You're going to have buyers that want to be, you know, the unique person on the block, but you're going to have other buyers that go, oh gosh, that's different. It doesn't conform. Again, I'm not saying it doesn't add value. I'm not saying it doesn't add, I'm saying it doesn't conform. It doesn't match its surrounding neighborhood, surrounding area. Jetson's house. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, I will keep going in unit 17.
right. We're good. All right, are we back? I know 10 minute breaks are hard, especially at home, because there's so much you can be doing and that you can unload the dishwasher, you can fold a load of laundry. There's so much you can do in that 10 minutes. It's easy to let time get away from you. My night class accuses me of somehow shortening their time. I'm not sure how I'm doing it, but they say I shorten their time. No, I don't. <laughs> All right. Still having our appraiser's hat on, thinking like an appraiser. Starting on page, uh, the bottom of page 438 over to 439, you talk about the appraisal process. Um, there's a couple different classes, categories of data that the appraiser studies that they collect. Specific data is specific to the property that you're studying. Specific data is specific to 123 Main Street. I want to know specifically the opinion of value of that property. You put a value on 123 Main Street, the house next door may have a different opinion. The house across the street is going to have different features. So it's specific to that property. We're going to learn in just a minute that property is what we refer to as our subject property. That's the property I'm studying. General data is the appraiser gathering information about the neighborhood, the area, the subdivision, the neighborhood, what are the amenities nearby, public transportation, infrastructure, et cetera. Then you have uh, the steps the appraiser takes. Now I'll let you guys uh, look through that. You know, it's a green star. So just have a basic understanding of these steps, kind of get an idea for things that the appraiser does, things that the appraiser looks at. Turn with me, if you will, to page 441. Did you guys bring your magnifying glass to class today? I should have had you do that, huh? 441 is our sample appraisal. In the real world, it really looks like this. And the good news is, is it usually comes in a PDF so you can blow it up and actually see it. But this is a sample just to give us an idea. Do you guys see the black bar on the left-hand side? The black bar is the different categories of the appraisal. So for example, you got the subject property, that's the property we're studying. There's the contract information, the neighborhood information, the site information, the lot dimensions, the improvements on the property, uh, the structure, the shed, the fence, whatever improvements we have on the property. All of these items in the black bar on the left are defined on page 440. Everybody see what I'm talking about? Subject, property, neighborhood, site, description of improvements. So any of these items on the black bar on the left are defined on 440. Flip over to 442, 443. We're gonna talk about the sales comparison approach. We're gonna talk about reconciliation over on 443, we're getting ready to talk about the cost approach, income. So once we talk about these things, we're gonna come back and we're gonna revisit this because I think this will make a lot more sense once we, once we discuss it. So what we're gonna do now with our appraiser's hat still on, what we're gonna do now is talk about the three approaches to value that the appraiser may take. We're going to talk about their process and the three approaches to value that they may take. Remember, you have your appraiser's hat on. The first approach to value that an appraiser may take is called the sales comparison approach. This is also known as the market data approach. What the appraiser is going to do is they're going to study the subject property. How many square footage is it? How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? Uh, how big is the lot? They're going to study the subject property, get all the information on the subject property. And then they're going to find properties that recently closed nearby. 
similar properties that recently closed nearby. What they can gather by studying those closed comps is I don't know what a buyer is willing to pay for my subject property, but I do know what other buyers have been willing to pay for properties nearby, for similar properties nearby. And we want properties as similar to our subject as we can. Please understand, no two properties are exactly alike. Even in your cookiest cutters of neighborhood, everything changes when you walk in the front door. So no two properties are exactly alike. So that's what we have to look for as similar as we can. The appraiser is not going to compare, for example, a condo to a two-story brick home. They're gonna to try to compare condo to condo, ranch to ranch. Some things that the appraiser tends to look at for, uh, they want the date of sale. How long ago did a buyer purchase? Typically, they like to try to go back about six months. But depending on the number of closings you've had in the last six months, they may have to go back further. In this market, they're having to go back further. Inventory's low, thus closings are low. You don't wanna go back too, too far though. What a buyer was willing to pay four years ago has no effect on what a buyer's willing to pay today. So they try to start with six months, go back further if necessary. Uh, look at the location. We want properties nearby, similar uh, in the same subdivision, in the same neighborhood. Uh, maybe they have to go out a quarter of a mile or half a mile radius. It depends on density. If you're downtown, you wouldn't have to go out as far, maybe a quarter mile. You go out to the middle of nowhere, you may not have a property for a mile away, right? So a lot of it depends on density, the location. But remember, you guys, value changes. Remember, Location, location, location. You could put a value on a home in Winston-Salem, pick that home up and move it to Greensboro, and it's gonna have a different value. You didn't change anything on the home, you just changed its location. So we want properties nearby. Our physical features of the property, square footage, how many bedrooms, how many baths, does it have a fireplace, does it have a garage? What's the size of the land? What's the size of the lot? And then terms and conditions of the sale. Um, foreclosures and short sales, for example, don't necessarily keep up with the market. All the lender wants is the money to to make them whole again. They don't care about keeping up with market trends or inflations. They just wanna sell the house for whatever they need to, to get the money back. So they need to study terms and conditions and how that affects it. Question came in from a broker's point of view, what's a better market for us, buyers or sellers? Well, right now it's sellers, right? Everybody wants listings. You get a listing, you're, you're doing good, but that, that pendulum is gonna change. One day we'll be back in a buyer's market. Somebody else says I'm breaking up. How am I doing? Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Okay. You guys may want to restart. So when the appraiser is looking at the sales comparison approach, only adjust the comps. The appraiser adjusts the comps to match the subject. Never ever adjust the subject. So the appraiser studies the subject property. They study the recently sold closed comps that are nearby and they make adjustments to the comps to match the subject. In just a minute, we're gonna talk a little bit more about our CMA and our BPO. This is based on the sales comparison approach. Understanding I don't know value. I can't tell you what the value of a bedroom is. So I need to get closer, okay. I don't know the value of a bedroom. It's hard for me to stand still. 
It's another reason why I miss being in the per in person in the classroom. <laughs> I don't know the value of a bedroom. So when I'm doing my CMA, I can't tell you, oh, we're going to, you know, add to or deduct from the value of a bedroom. That's the appraiser's job. But I can study the CMA. And those recently closed comps nearby to get an idea for what a buyer might be the probable sales price that a buyer might be willing to pay. The sales comparison approach is the best approach for the appraiser to use when putting value on single family homes and land. So anytime their um, approaches to value, everyone they're using, sales comparison approach, single family homes and land. Let's do a little exercise together. Either stand up if you can, or push yourself back a little bit, give yourself some room. If you stand up, please make sure you're decent from the waist down. Thank you. <laughs> so we said the subject property, we never adjust the subject property. We always adjust the comps to match the subject, okay? So everybody take your left hand, make a fist and hold it straight out in front of you. Left hand, make a fist. Actually, you know what, let's, let's really have some fun. Now we can all see each other, right? Okay, left hand, make a fist, hold it straight out in front of you. We're gonna call this your subject property. Your subject property is never gonna change. Your left hand is gonna fall asleep before we're done with this conversation. It's never gonna change. Let's say you have a comp with a feature superior to your subject property. A superior comp means that it's higher. So take your right hand, make a fist and hold your right hand straight over your head. Let's say your subject has three bedrooms and your comp has four. Everybody with me? It has a superior feature. It has features more than your subject property. What do you have to do to make your comp match your subject? What do you have to do to make your right hand match your subject? You have to lower it. You have to decrease the comp by a number of a bedroom. You guys with me? So your subject has three bedrooms, your comp has four. How do you make your comp match your subject? You decrease it by the value of a bedroom. Now take your right hand, shake it off. Take your right hand and make a fist and hold it down by your side. Hold it down by your side. Let's say your subject has three bedrooms and your comp has two, which is more, three or two. Your subject now has more, right? Your comp is inferior. It has less than. How do you make this comp match your subject? You add two. You increase it. So if you guys do this trick, we're getting ready to do this. But if you guys remember, the, did your left hand ever move? Did your left hand budge at all? It stayed perfectly still. Then it might have gotten a little shaky because you were holding it up, but it stayed perfectly still. What you adjusted was your right arm. If your right arm is inferior to your left arm, you add to it. If your right arm is superior to your left arm, you deduct. So remember that little trick in just a second. All right, you're done, thank you. Wasn't that fun? If you remember that trick and really what we just did my perfect steady line, about as straight as I can get it, is my subject property. The subject never changes. If I have a comp, comp one has a superior feature, comp two has an inferior feature, I deduct comp one down to match the subject, or I add two comp one to match the subject. Never, ever, ever adjust the subject. Never adjust the subject. Remember those absolute words we talked about on day one? Is there any wiggle room to never? Never, ever. You always adjust the comps to match the subject.
when the appraiser is selecting comps, and when you and I are looking at comps for our CMA as well, we want to find a similar to the subject properties we can. The fewer adjustments we have to make to the comps, the better. So we want things as similar as we can. You want things that are recently sold, again, in a competitive, fair market. Maybe you have to go back more than six months if necessary. Don't go back two years. The appraiser assigns a dollar value to the differences. Again, I don't know the value of a bedroom. I have no idea. You probably don't either unless you wanna to go to appraisal school. So don't act like an appraiser if you're not. I cannot put a value on anything. I can't tell you what a fireplace is worth. I can't tell you what a garage goes for. And once the appraiser adjusts the comps to match the subject, they put a value on the subject using a correlation. Correlation is not a simple averaging. It's a weighted average. So in other words, a square foot doesn't have as much value as a fireplace. A fireplace doesn't have the same kind of value as a bedroom. Everything is studied separately. Everything is studied independently. We're gonna look at the, at the math on this in just a second. Is everybody good? The appraiser does the sales comparison approach. We do the CMA. Is everybody good with that? Two different reports, two different findings. Appraisers putting their opinion on the value. You and I are given our probable sales price. As we said, our CMA is the closest thing that we use to the sales comparison approach. And I got a sample CMA. I'll pull up for you guys in just a second so you can see, have an idea of what it looks like. The CMA is the informal version that we do. And when I report my probable sales price, I'm going to report it as a range. Remember my little story a little bit ago with my couple? And I looked at them and I said, based on our CMA, I think your probable sales price is between $95,000 and $100,000. I gave them a range. I didn't give them an exact number. When the appraiser is doing their sales comparison approach, the appraiser will only look at closed comps. They want to know what a buyer was willing to pay recently. When you and I are doing our CMAs, we're going to look at closed comps. But we also want to look at current and expired listings. Remember, we're doing a CMA, for example, for our seller, when the seller wants to know how much should I list my house for. When I'm having a discussion with a seller about how much to list their house for, why are current proper properties um, important? Why do we wanna know what's currently on the market, what's currently for sale nearby? Why do I care about that? Yeah, yeah. If there's a house for sale across the street, isn't that my direct competition? Right, that's what we're up against. If you have a buyer that really wants to live in this neighborhood, they're gonna consider your listing, Mr. Seller, or they're gonna consider the house across the street. So we need to stay competitive. We need to know what the current market is in that neighborhood when we're discussing that with them. When I'm with sellers, why do we care about expired listings? They're expired, they're gone, they're in the past. Why do we care about those? An expired listing, no buyer was willing to pay that amount for that property, were they? Was it overpriced? I don't know. I don't know until I study it, but what I do know is it sat on the market for X amount of time and after X amount of time, it didn't sell. So back to my couple, they tell me we wanna get 135. If I 
could find some expired listings, some properties that were listed for 135 that didn't sell for 135. You guys with me? It can help me show the seller, look, somebody else nearby tried to sell their home for 135 and it didn't work out for them. These are the similarities. These are the differences. So when we do our CMAs, we're looking at active. We're looking at expired. We're looking at closed. Um, question came in, why not just get a comp that's similar? I'm getting a comp as similar as I possibly can, but there's always going to be adjustments because no two properties are exactly the same. No two properties, no two parcels of land. Another question, what would I consider a pool? Like my opinion, I, I would run away from a pool. That's a lot of liability, a lot of work, but other people may have different opinions. So it's the pool is in the eyes of the beholder. When we do CMAs, we need to keep these current throughout our listing. Anytime that we talk to our sellers about price, we need to have a fresh CMA. Now this market is truly unique because we don't have listings that last that long. But once we get out of this market, you may have a listing for two or three, four months. That's okay, that's normal by the way. Where we're at right now, two days, is not normal. Everybody hear what I'm saying? <laughs> Where we're at right now is not normal. So you have a listing for three months. We've had some showings, we've had some interest, but no buyers have made an offer. Sellers getting frustrated. They say, gosh, maybe we need to talk about adjusting the price. Before you have that conversation, you need to do a CMA because the CMA you did three months ago to get the listing has probably changed. Things that closed have fallen off. There's been things that have closed within the last three months. So anytime you talk to a seller about price, you need to have a fresh CMA in your hand. And CMAs are a client level service. I do not owe my customer a CMA. I owe my customer market data. Here's information about the area. Here's the tax information. If they want a CMA, they should have hired me. Think about the buyer, obviously the buyer. Real Estate Commission weighs in on CMAs. We're accountable for performing them in a competent manner. Failure to do so in a competent manner will result in a disciplinary action. We'll see this again in license law and commission rule. This one has talked about both. Here's the deal. Um, when you affiliate with your firms, you'll get CMA training. Your BIC will help you. Uh, you may sit down with a seasoned agent. That's what we call those of us that have been around for a while, seasoned agent. It has more experience. Um, I know, for example, the Winston-Salem Board of Realtors about once a quarter offers a CMA class. They just did one yesterday. So there's training out there. But guys, keep in mind, sometimes two heads are better than one. If you have a more unique property, if you want another opinion, it's okay to reach out to your peers and ask for them to look at it. It's okay to ask your bit. Hey, can you, can you look at this and tell me what you think? Maybe I'm missing something. But you need to get training on these to make sure that you do these competently. Remember what the Real Estate Commission's number one purpose is, is to protect the public when they're dealing with us. And if you're just blurting a number out to a seller, if you're just rapid fire doing a CMA for a buyer and you're giving them poor advice, the Real Estate Commission may hold you accountable for that. A question came in in your MLS, can you search the potential listing address and surrounding neighborhood to get those comps? Sure. And for um, CMAs, which is what we do, we'd use the MLS to help us with that because all the data from the MLS can help us get that information. Active, under contract, expired, closed, absolutely use our CMAs 
for that. Again, I got a sample CMA we'll look at in just a second. Any questions so far before we look at the math? Yeah, I got math. CMA sales comparison approach. So for your exam, you could see this asked two different ways. I don't know that you'll see this, but we're gonna mention it anyway. You may be given information of two comps and there's only one thing that's different between them. So for example, comp one has a three bedroom that recently sold for 250,000. Comp two has four bedrooms that recently sold for 254.5. That's the only difference is the number of bedrooms. Everything else is exactly the same. So based on this information, can we deduct that the value of a bedroom is $4,500? Because that's the only thing different. Everybody see what we did there? You may see this. If you see this, they can only give you, they're not gonna say, well, there's a fireplace and a garage and a bedroom. They're not gonna give you, they're only gonna give you one difference and they have to give you sales prices. So you can take your sales prices, the only difference we can deduct that the value of a bedroom is $4,500. What you're more likely to see, I gotta get myself a, a, a whiteboard up. So I have room. What you're more likely to see is something that looks like this. Whoops, can you guys see that okay? It's gonna give you a bunch of information. Here's information on the subject property. Here's information on comp one. Here's information on comp two. And then it has to give us the value. It'll have to give you the value because we're not in appraiser school. Okay, so it has to tell you the value. The problem wants to know what's the probable sales price of the subject property. So we're gonna study the subject and then we're gonna study each comp as it relates to the subject. Now, when I do these, this is just my personal preference. You can do them however you like. I like nice, neat rows and columns. So I have my subject property. I have comp one and I have comp two. The features of the property that I'm studying, I'm gonna compare the bedroom. I'm gonna compare the bathrooms and I'm gonna compare the garage. The problem tells me that my subject property is three bedrooms, it's two bath, and it's a one car garage. Comp one is a two bedroom, one bath, and a one car garage. And comp two is a three bedroom, one and a half bath, and a two car garage. I'm also told that my comps recently sold, comp two recently sold for 123 and comp one recently sold for 118. I took the word problem and I put it in nice neat rows and columns. So now I can clearly see, these are the features of my subject property. These are the features of my comp, comp one and comp two. The suggestion for the appraiser and me and you is that we look at at least three good comps. I just did two for simplicity. But in the real world, we're always going to want to look at three good comps. So let's study comp one as it relates to my subject. If my subject has three bedrooms and comp one has two, what do I have to do to comp two, or I'm sorry, comp one to make it match my subject? What do I have to do? I have to add, right? And I'm going to add the value of a bedroom. And the problem tells me that a bedroom is valued at $4,500. Now on my subject property, I got two bathrooms and my comp has one. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna make my comp match my subject? Again, I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add the value of a bedroom. You guys use the hand trick. My subject has a one car garage. My comp has a one car garage. 
they're already but right on, right? And you don't make it, need to make any changes to that, do I? Because they already match. So I take my 118,000, which is what a buyer was willing to pay for comp one. And I'm gonna adjust comp one to make it match my subject. So I take my 118,000, I add the value of a bedroom and I add the value of a bathroom and I have an adjusted price whoops, of $126,500. This is comp one as it relates to my subject. We're never gonna compare comp to comp. We're always gonna compare each comp to the subject. Why don't you guys take a few minutes and tell me the adjusted value of comp two, what you think the adjusted value of comp two is, and then we'll talk about what we're gonna do with our findings. And by the way, for our purposes, if a full bath goes for $4,000, then a half a bath goes for $2,000. I'm not gonna split hairs over this. You got 30 more seconds, then we'll talk about it. Okay. So now I'm going to study comp two as it relates to my subject. I don't care about comp one, right? I've already adjusted the value of comp one. So we're gonna study comp two as it relates to the subject. My subject has three bedrooms. My comp has three bedrooms. Are there any adjustments to make to comp two with the number of bedrooms? No, we're already right on, right? My subject has two bathrooms. My comp has one and a half. So what do I need to do to make my comp match my subject? I need to add the value of a half of a bathroom. And again, we're not splitting hairs because we're not an appraiser school. So if a full bath goes for 4,000, then it stands to reason that a half a bath is gonna go for 2,000. My subject has a one car garage. My comp has a two car garage. The comp has a superior feature, yes? What am I gonna do to make my comp match my subject? I'm going to deduct the cost of a one car garage. Use the hand trick. Problem tells me that a car or garage, a one car garage goes for $5,000. 
So I take the sales price of 123,000, 123. I add 2,000. And then I subtract 5,000. So now I have an adjusted comp of $120,000. If the appraiser is doing this, they would use their correlation to give their opinion of value. It's gonna be somewhere between here. It depends on what they put more weight on. Do they think a garage is more valuable than a bedroom? I would not subtract. So let's see, for the bathroom, is that not right? My subject has two, my comp has less than. My right hand is by my side, right? The subject has two, the comp has one and a half. So to make it match, I have to add. Do the hand trick, do the hand trick. I, again, I got you guys looking all sorts of funny at PSI Testing Center. I got you looking at where your butt is. I got you counting on your fingers. And now I got you sitting there going, oh, you better, oh, you better. I don't care. Look silly at PSI Testing Center. Everybody with me? These things help for a reason. I'm gonna get a call one day from PSI Testing Center. What is it you guys do in pre-licensing? <laughs> That's okay, I'll answer that call. You and I would give this as a range. Remember, we would report this as a range. The appraiser is gonna give value. <laughs> Any questions on this? Is this good with everybody? Never ever adjust the subject. You always adjust the comps to match the subject. So let's look, turn with me if you will, in your book to page 446. Four forty six is our sample sales comparison approach. Our subject property is one fifty five Potter Drive. And right underneath that, you can see the information, six years old, size of the lot, it's a ranch, six rooms, three bedrooms, one and a half baths. And then this appraiser found five good comps. They went overboard a little bit, but that's okay. Remember the suggestion is you find at least three. So the appraiser studied comp A, comp B, comp C, comp D and comp E. And they listed the features of the comps. You can see the sales prices. The sales prices tell us this is what a buyer was willing to pay for that property. This is what a buyer paid for it. And then they make adjustments to the comp. So for example, comp C. Comp C has a larger lot. The subject's lot is this size. Comp C's lot is this size. So what did they do to make the comp match the subject? They deducted $5,000. And once they go through and make all their adjustments, at the very bottom, you have adjusted value. These are the comps as they relate to the subject. If you were to study 157 Potter Drive, the comps would be different because the subject property is always different. You always study the comps as they relate to the subject. A question comes in, for comps, we always use property currently listed for sale. We're looking at closed comps, not active listings. When I'm doing my CMA with the seller, the reason I look at active listings is to study our competition, know what we are currently up against. But we always need to study closed comps. The appraiser will always look at closed. You and I need to look at closed as well because that's what a buyer is willing to pay for it. Questions on the Sample sales comparison approach. Can I erase this? Does everybody have, have this? So Julie, Julie, yeah. when I'm looking at this and it says, <clears throat> like, I'm looking at the subject property and it says location good. And when you go over to comp B, it says poor. That means comp B's location is poorer. Then, so below, so That's I right. add 6,500. That's right. Okay. It's inferior. Yep. It's inferior to the subject. And I don't know what that condition is, right? But right, what I do right. know is it's poor, which means it's inferior. So here's my subject. My comp is down here by my side. So how do I make my comp match my subject? 
I uh, add. Okay. That's exactly what the appraiser is looking at. Yep. Okay. So our sample sales comparison is on 446. Um, I pulled just so we can see. I went to MLS the other day and pulled a sample CMA. So when I'm going to my listing appointment, when I'm going, when my buyer says, how much should I offer? Um, the information at the top is our legend. So the MLS number, the address, the city, how many stories is it? Bedrooms, full baths, half baths, the year built, acres, square foot, cost per square foot, the list price, the sold price, the sold date, the sale list ratio, and then DOM stays for days on the market. So if I were listing a property in this neighborhood, first off, we would look at our active listings because this would be our current competition. This is what we would be up against. These are the properties that we need to be, right? I wanna get my seller under contract before these guys. This is our competition. We also have our closed comps. These are properties that recently sold. This is what a buyer was willing to pay for these properties. And again, you can compare the features. Now I'm not making adjustments to the features. I'm just kind of using this as a guide. I can't put value on a bedroom in this neighborhood. You'll know, obviously, for the active properties, I don't have a sold price yet, sold date, right? Because we don't know. We're still active. We haven't closed yet. Um, but now that these have closed, I can compare what was it listed for versus what it actually sold for. Check out what's happening in this market right now. Properties are selling for more than what they're listed for the sale to list ratio is higher. I mean, this one listed for 219.9 and it sold for 222.5. This is the market we're in. Um, I also have pending properties that are under contract. I don't know the sold information yet. They're not gonna give me the sold information until it actually closes. This is primarily to protect the seller. Think about it. If they told me what this home was under contract for, and then this contract fell through, now every buyer knows what that seller is willing to accept. So we don't know the closed information until it actually closes. But I do know that at these prices in this condition, a buyer was willing to bring an offer. I don't know what it closed for, but I do know somebody is willing to put it under contract. Does that make sense? So I'm kind of looking at under contract, like active, but it's not my direct competition. Let's come back to market. I could not for the life of me find an expired listing. We just, we're not dealing with expired listings much in this market because inventory is so low. But again, when I'm doing this for my seller, expired listings are helpful. I'll be like, look, this thing was on the market for days on market, however many days. And at this price, for whatever reason, it was unable to, to close. It was unable to, um, a buyer wasn't willing to, to pay for it. In addition, in MLS, you guys will also have, um, you have a history in MLS. Any property that's ever been in the MLS, you have access to. I think it goes back to like 1997 or something like that. Obviously, we're not studying closed comps back that far. But also, when you guys get into MLS, you'll be able to see pictures. So you can look at interior pictures of, these closed properties versus the property you're trying to list or the buyer is willing to um, write up the offer for. So again, this is your CMA versus your sales comparison approach. This is the Winston-Salem Board of Realtors at, or Triad MLS, I guess I should say. If you're in another MLS, your CMA may look a little different, but the idea is gonna be the same. This is what I'm taking to my listing appointment. This is what I'm sharing with my buyer when they say, ooh, this is the one, let's write it up. What should I offer? This is the CMA that we do um, for our clients. Questions on that? Is this all information we're allowed to share with a client? Yep, yep. Guys, as a matter of fact, some agents 
once we study this and I say, all right, um, I think, you know, for example, Mr. Buyer, I think you're, um, I let's see the average close price is 199.5. So I don't know, make something up. You want to offer 200,000. The buyer says, no, 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 I want to get in. I'm going to offer 250. All right, that's up to them, right? I can't make anybody do anything. I can't make them not do anything. If they're insistent on offering 250, a lot of agents are getting buyers to sign off on this, <laughs> acknowledging that I didn't recommend they offer 250. So a lot of agents, not only am I sharing it with them, I'm saying, great, we've talked about it. Initial and date here, please. Just as an extra measure to protect themselves. So when they're like, you made me pay 250. Oh no, oh no, no. I suggested this. Uh, generated by a software on MLS. Yep, yep. Clickety click <laughs> and print. And this is where you guys get training on what to clickety click. They're going to be all different because all properties are different. So yeah, this came straight from uh, straight from MLS, and I think yeah, I just have pending. Other questions or comments? This is good stuff, isn't it? So again, you guys, don't just blurt a number out. Do your research, pull your comps, have an educated response when the buyer seller says, what should I list it for? And when the buyer says, what should I offer? Everybody good with that? Because you're held accountable for it. I wish I saw more thumbs ups. Okay, good, thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We come back, we're gonna talk about some other approaches to value that the appraiser will use.
All right, let's take attendance. I got a question. So sales comparison approach is one approach to value that the appraiser can take. Sales comparison approach is the best approach when the appraiser is trying to put value on a single family home or land. Another approach that the appraiser can take to help them arrive at value is called the cost approach. The cost approach is best for special use properties. Think schools, churches, libraries, hospitals. Cost approach is also best for new construction. If you're building a new construction community and the neighborhood next door next to it was built in the 60s, it's not fair to compare something that was built in the 60s to something that's being built right now. So cost approach, special use properties that does include new construction. And what the cost approach does is it separates the land and the structure. The appraiser will put a value on the land as if it were vacant. If you were to tear the structure down and sell the land, they can do that using the sales comparison approach or another method we're getting ready to talk about. And then the appraiser puts value on the structure. They study the structure. So they separate the two. They do two different values. Value the land as if it was vacant and then value the structure. When the appraiser is studying the structure, there's a couple different methods that they could put cost on the structure. They may use a reproduction cost. If we were to build this exact building, an exact duplicate, what would it cost at current prices? Reproduction cost is good for um, historic buildings. If you were building a house in Old Salem, for example, what would it cost you to build an exact duplicate? Replacement cost is not an exact duplicate, but it serves the same purpose. If you were building a school today, it's still a school, but it's gonna have different features than a school that was built in the 60s, right? Schools today are probably wired differently. They have Wi-Fi and all these things that we didn't know about back in the 60s. So it's an, an, not a duplicate, but it serves the same purpose. Couple of different methods to help them determine. Um, I hope everything's okay. Couple of different methods to determine uh, the cost. Probably the more common is the square foot method. How much does each square foot cost? Remember cost per square foot in unit one or four, I'm sorry, unit four. Cost per square foot, you take the cost divided by the number of square feet and it tells you how much does each square foot cost. We could be doing the square foot method on the structure, determining how much each square foot of the building is. We could be do, using the square foot method for the land to determine square feet, front feet, possibly acres. Cost per square foot, cost per acres. So you're studying how much each square foot costs times the number of square feet, and that gives the appraiser a value. This is the most, whoops, this is the most common method. Um, just to mention, when the appraiser is trying to put cost replacement cost, they could also, you look at unit in place. Unit in place is a construction cost per unit of measure. How much does each unit cost when you take into account material, labor, overhead? Unit per measure. And then quantity survey method. How much are the raw materials cost to build this structure? Again, the more common, the most popular for appraisers is the square foot method.
when the appraiser is studying the structure, they have to take into account depreciation. As buildings age, they lose value. Depreciation is the loss in value for any reason. As buildings age, they lose value. And the appraiser considers three different types of depreciation. We're gonna break these down and talk about them. So first up, we have physical deterioration. Physical deterioration is just ordinary wear and tear. Things just naturally aren't the same as what they were 30 years ago. And there's two types of physical deterioration. The first one is, is curable physical deterioration. It's curable because it's physically and economically feasible to cure it. Curable physical deterioration is routine maintenance, such as painting a house every once in a while. Sometimes the roof needs to be replaced. Those things don't last forever. It's physically and economically feasible to, to cure it, to correct it. Incurable physical deterioration may not be economically feasible. Anytime you start dealing with foundation, structural issues, things start getting expensive. And before you run out and repair the foundation, before you uh, support the load bearing wall, for example, the appraiser, the homeowner, everybody needs to ask, is this gonna be economically worth it? Is it economically feasible? If not, then it's incurable. At this point, I feel the note to say that this picture just serves as an example. I'm not a structural engineer. I'm not telling you that this needs to be fixed or replaced. I'm just using it as an example. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> so incurable, incurable physical deterioration. Another category of depreciation is functional obsolete. Things that just aren't functional anymore. They're outdated. And again, we have curable functional obsolete. Things that are easy, economically feasible to fix them. My bedroom growing up as a child, I had blue shag carpet and I wish it looked as good as this blue shag carpet you're looking at in your bedroom or in this picture. I wished it was that pretty. That would be a curable functional obsolete. You can rip the carpet up, put new carpet down. I had an apartment. Gosh, it was horrible. Every single thing in the kitchen, the counters, the wall, the floor, the refrigerator, the oven, every single thing in that kitchen was avocado green. Tacky. That is a curable functional obsolete. Avocado green kitchen appliances are no longer popular. That's a curable functional obsolete. An incurable functional obsolete is not economically feasible to fix. This picture, this little house you're looking at was built in the 20s. It has four bedroom and one bath. Back in the 20s, one bathroom was acceptable. Today, we want our own bathroom, don't we? All of us, we all want our own bathroom. It may not be economically feasible to add a second bath. In other words, you may not be able to get that return. It could be incurable. Um, window air conditioning units. Some older homes may not have central AC. They may have window units. It may not be economically feasible to install central air conditioning. Incurable functional obsolete.
And then the last category of depreciation is economic obsolete. This is incurable only. There is no curable. It's incurable only. Economic obsolete are things that are outside of the property boundaries. Can't do anything about them. It's nearby, it's next door. My Winston-Salem people, we all know where Village Tavern is, right? Everybody knows where Village Tavern is. And Village Tavern, Griffith Road, runs behind Village Tavern. If you drive down Griffith Road, keep going, keep going, keep going, till you get to the end of Griffith Road and it dead ends onto Clemensville Road. What you're looking at here is a picture of the intersection of Griffith Road and Clemens, or Clemens Road, Clemensville, Clemens Road. This is the sewer treatment plant. In a hot August summer afternoon, it does not smell good on the corner of Griffith and Clemens Road. Properties located near landfills, a hot, humid summer day, it does not smell good. That's an economic obsolete. I apologize. The Village Tavern near the mall, I apologize. Anybody ever been up to Canton, North Carolina? Canton, North Carolina is in the mountains. Canton, North Carolina is a paper mill town. Canton, North Carolina <laughs> stinks. Oh, it's awful. The whole town is in economic obsolete. I had a friend from college took me home one weekend. I said, oh God, what is that smell? And she said, you'll get used to it after a while. I don't want to get used to that. Are you kidding me? You guys ever drive to the beach, drive by a good farm, chicken coop? Those are economic obsoletes. Nothing you can do about it. They're outside of the property boundaries. So when the appraiser is putting value on the structure, they have to look at depreciation. They have to consider um, physical deterioration, functional obsoletes, economic obsoletes. Questions on that, comments? Still trying to put um, value on the structure. The appraiser needs to determine the effective age. How long does this structure add value? The effective age tells the appraiser how long it adds value. The economic life, how many number of years, if you make an improvement, how many years do you expect the improvement to add value? Understand, if the appraiser says it's gonna add value for 30 years, it's not like at 30 years, the structure is gonna fall down. It's just after third year, 30 years, it no longer contributes to the value. It no longer adds value. It's maxed as effective age or it's economic life if any improvements are done. And when it comes to um, figuring out depreciation, how the structure is gonna depreciate, probably the most common method for the appraiser and the tax accountant for that matter, is to use a straight line to method, straight line method depreciation. So let's say, for example, we determine that this structure will add value for 30 years. It loses the same amount of value every year. Year one, it loses the same amount, year 12, year 15, year 24, whatever. Let's just pretend that the cost of the structure is $600,000. The cost of the structure is $600,000. And if we determine its effective life is 30 years, we take 600,000, divide it by 30, and straight line depreciation says every year it's gonna lose $20,000 in value. Year one, it's gonna depreciate $20,000, year two, year 15, year 29, each year it's gonna depreciate, it's gonna lose $20,000 in value. 
for our purposes, only the structure depreciates. Land does not depreciate. Land will always have value. Structures come and go. Tear a building down, you put build a new one up. Land does not depreciate, just the structure. So again, the cost approach. The appraiser separates the structure and the land. They put value on the structure, studying the depreciation, studying the, studying the effective age, the economic life. They put a value on the land and then they combine the two to offer their opinion of value for the whole property. Let's look, page 448. There's our sample cost approach. Once again, our subject property is 155 Potter Drive. We first put a value on the land. We use the square foot method to determine the value of the land at $27,000. The appraiser added 8,000 for improvements, driveways, landscaping. So put a total value of the land at $35,000. Then we put a value on the structure. There's our replacement costs using the square foot method again. Less any depreciation. So replacement costs minus our depreciation gives us a value of the building of 81,750. Add them together, the appraisal will give their opinion of value using the cost approach of 116,750. Value on the land, value on the structure. More important to me that you pay attention. Cost approach is the best for the appraiser when determining special use properties. They'll put the more weight on special use properties. The appraiser can use the cost approach on any property. And we're gonna learn in just a minute, the appraisers encouraged to use as many of the three approaches as they can to come to their opinion. So they can always do the cost approach, but they're gonna put more weight on the cost approach when they're trying to put a value on a special use property, new construction, schools, churches, et cetera. Questions on the cost approach. The third approach to value that appraisers may use is the income capitalization approach. The income capitalization approach is the best approach for properties that produce an income. They are income producing properties, apartment buildings, retail stores, office parks. They produce an income. And the basis behind the income capitalization approach says that the value of the building, the value of the structure is related to how much income it produces. How much rent can we collect? So income capitalization approach is best for properties that produce an income. One thing the appraiser and the investor consider is the net operating income. The net operating income or the NOI helps the investor analyze the profitability of the income producing property. How profitable is it? 
And when looking at the net operating income, the investor specifically cares about the capitalization rate. The capitalization rate is their rate of return. The capitalization rate says, how long does it take me to get my money back from this investment, from this income producing property? All investors have a different level of risk tolerance, require different rate of return. If you're an investor and you only have one investment property, all of your eggs are in that basket. If you're an investor and you have 20 rental properties, you don't have as high of a risk. You can have a vacancy and know the other 19 will help support. So capitalization rate varies person to person. Everybody has different tolerance. With the income capitalization approach, there's a formula that we just have to know. We just got to know it. Take a minute, jot it down. Great candidate for a flashcard. Haven't figured out the T-bar for it yet. Jot it down and then we'll talk about it. So the formula starts with looking at the potential gross income, also known as the PGI. The PGI is the dream. When you have 100% occupancy, 100% of the time, what's the most you can make off of this rental property, this income producing property? You collect every rent from every tenant on time, every time. That's the dream. The truth is investors are always gonna have vacancy. Even your best tenant may move out one day. Then you gotta get it ready for the next tenant, right? So when you deduct vacancy and collection losses, collection losses, if you have to take a tenant to court to collect rent, you gotta consider that. You deduct vacancy and collection losses from the PGI to get your effective gross income, also known as your EGI. The effective gross income is the reality. The PGI says this is the max I can make on this investment property. EGI says this is how much I'm actually making. How much am I actually collecting? From the effective gross income, deduct your operating expenses. Operating expenses are those expenses that you need to operate your business. Maintenance, janitorial, management fees, taxes, insurance, advertising, marketing. For our purposes, everything's gonna be part of operating expenses except your debt service. Debt service is not part of your operating expenses. We're actually gonna learn what to do with debt service when we get into unit 12. But you need to know that debt services are not included in operating expenses because they may like to trick you on your test and give you debt services and you need to know that's a distractor. So you deduct your operating expenses from your EGI and you get the net operating income. 
Now we get to use a T-bar. The net operating income is part of the value of the property. When looking at our capitalization rate. For your exam, it'll give you one or the other. It's either gonna give you value and ask you for cap rate, or it's gonna give you the capitalization rate and ask you for value. It's not gonna give you the net operating income. It's gonna give you the information you need to find the net operating income. This formula is always calculated annually. So when the problem gives you monthly rent, you wanna do what? Multiply by 12. When they give you mul or, uh, monthly operating expenses, times it by 12 to get annual. This problem is always calculated annually. Now I got one for you guys to work in just a second, never fear. Before you do that though, let's look on page 452. 452. And there's our sample income capitalization approach. You start with the PGI of $60,000, that's 100% capacity. $60,000 a year is the max I can collect on rent from this property. Then this particular property has income from other sources. So they have a vending machine and something called a pay phone, which adds $600. So if they're maxing out, if they're collecting, the dream for this property would be $60,600. At these rates, you cannot make, you cannot collect any more this year than $60,600. That's the dream. This particular property has a 4% vacancy loss. So the dream is the 60,600. The reality is we're only collecting 58,176. From your EGI, you deduct operating expenses. There's your taxes and insurance, maintenance, utilities, repairs, decorating, I would mean decorating expenses. Um, legal and accounting, advertising, management. Not included in that list is debt service. Add up all your operating expenses, get the 27,300. Deduct your operating expenses from your EGI to get a net operating income, $30,876. We are told it's a 10% capitalization rate. So you take your 30,876, divide it by 10% to get a value. The value of this property is based off of the income it produces. So the appraiser would put a value on this building of $308,760. Oh, I almost forgot the best part. Why do I have a big, big plate of Oreos here, you ask? That'd be funny not to tell you that. Some students like to remember this formula by thinking of Oreos and thinking of the mnemonic, poor Violet eats Oreos nightly. Poor Violet eats Oreos nightly. I don't think Violet's doing too, too bad if she's eating Oreos every night, but poor Violet, <laughs> good for her. Hopefully they're double stuff too, right? Poor Violet eats Oreos nightly. Capitalization rate is my, um, in the problem we just looked at, 10%, they gave it to me in the, in the problem on page 452. Capitalization rate, 10%. I don't care how you memorize a formula. If you want to think about Violet, great. If you want to put on a flashcard, fantastic. Knowing the formula is 80% of the, of the problem. If you don't know the formula, you don't know what to do with these numbers. Now everybody's going to go to the store and get some Oreos.
Julie? Yeah. Who provides his cap rate? Where does it come from? Oh, it's, it, I'm sorry, it's the opinion of the investor. It's their rate of return. So the investor has a cap rate, a desired cap rate that they want. So if they have one investment property, they're going to want a higher cap rate. They're going to need a higher rate of return. If they have 20 investment properties, they may not need a higher rate of return because they can use the other 19 to help them out when they need to. Julie, I think I think I wrote this down wrong. OK, let me read this back. So potential gross income minus vacancy and collection losses equals gross income. Effective gross income. Uh huh. And then effective gross income minus operating expenses equals the NOI. Correct. OK, oh, OK, I did write it down right. All right. And then you can take your NOI and plop it in a T-bar, because, again, the problem is going to ask you for value or cap rate. They're going to give you one, they're going to ask you for the other, and then they're going to give you the information you need to find the net operating income. Okay, got it. So step one is to find NOI, step two is to find value or cap rate. the essence can you repeat that um, i think we were just verifying that the formula was written down correct if you have annual and you want monthly you divide by 12 this problem is always answered annually so your test is going to give you monthly your test is going to give you monthly rent it's going to give you monthly operating expenses you need to know that this problem is worked annually so you can take the monthly times 12 to get annual. Would you need an appraiser to determine your cap rate on a duplex? The appraiser is giving you their opinion of value. The investor determines what their desired capitalization rate is, what their rate of return. No, to go from monthly to annual, you take monthly times 12 to get annual. Monthly times 12 to get annual. All right, everybody have all this written down? Private chat, tell me what you think.
you about 30 more seconds and then we'll talk about it. I love the question marks. <laughs> so when we see a math problem, what do we do first? We just pick our calculator up and start punching a bunch of numbers away? No, just read, just read. Don't cry either, just read. <laughs> you know what, that's not fair. It's okay to cry, crying's okay. Shake it off, move on, right? Okay, so each unit of a fourplex rents for $650 per month Vacancy losses average 10% per year. Operating expenses are 1,300 per month. If the property is valued at 150,000, what is the investor's capitalization rate? Guys, remember when I do math, I like to always start with where I wanna end. Meaning I want to first identify my X. If I identify my X first, it helps me keep my focus. It helps me keep my attention. The only thing I care about is getting to that X. So how do I get to that X? What do I need? Well, I need the value. Problem tells me the property is valued at $150,000. The other piece I need is the net operating income. Do I know that? Not yet, but I have the tools that I need to get it, right? So we're gonna step aside for a second. If I have a fourplex, how many units is that? That's four units. Each unit collects $650 per month. So how much can I collect each month? Each month, I will collect $2,600 in rent. This problem is solved annually. So if that's my monthly rent, then I can get an annual rent of $200, $31,200. This is my PGI. This is the dream. If I were to collect rent on time, every time on all four of these units, the most I can make on this property this year is $31,200. That's the dream. I have everybody so far. Four units, rent for 650 times by 12 to get my annual, my dream, my potential gross income. I have vacancy losses of 10%. 10%. Take my dream, $31,200. And I have vacancy losses of $3,120. When I deduct the vacancy from my PGI, I get an EGI, effective gross income, of 28,080. The dream is for me to collect 31,200 a year on this property. The reality is I'm only collecting $28,080. The dream versus the reality. I have a 10% vacancy and collection loss. Operating expenses are 1,300 per month. I need annual. So I get annual 
multiply by 12, I get annual operating expenses. $15,600. Deduct that from my uh, dream. I can't see that number now, 28080. To get a net operating income of $12,480. That's the missing piece of this puzzle. I had to find my net operating income. In order to find my net operating income, I had to know the formula. That fourth line means divide. So I take 12,480, divide it by 150,000. On my calculator, I'm running out of room here. On my calculator, I get a rate of 0.0832, that's the rate. If the problem wants to know percent, I just move my decimal over two places. Your calculator always gives you rate. Your test is gonna ask you for one or the other. They're not gonna have both of these as an answer choice. All the answers are either gonna be in the form of rate or the form of percent. Everybody with me? but you need to know how to convert a rate to a percent just in case they ask for percent. Rate to percent, move your decimal over two places for a capitalization rate, capitalization percent of 8.32%. Questions? Formula, flashcard. So the three approaches to value that the appraiser can take, sales comparison approach, cost approach, and income capitalization approach. We're gonna talk about what the appraiser does with those in just one second. Is everybody good if I erase this? Everybody have this? Everybody set? Okay. We'll come back to that in just one second. There's a little, I guess, interruption. Sometimes an investor may not know the potential gross income. Sometimes an investor may not know the operating expenses. If they're thinking about purchasing this property, they may not have this information. And the investor wouldn't be able to do the income capitalization approach because they don't know this information. So another tool an investor can use to help them determine if it's worth their investment is something called the gross rent multiplier. The gross rent multiplier, what I affectionately refer to as the germ, tells the investor it relates the sales price of the property to their expected rental income. They may not know what the property is renting for, but they can compare their purchase to what they think they're going to get in, collect, in, in rent. Basically, the GRM answers the question for the investor, how long will it take me to get my money back? How long will it take me to get my money back? The lower the germ, the better. The lower the germ means the faster you'll get your money back or the investor will get their money back. And the formula for the germ, it's pretty simple. Sales price divided by our expected rental income. Typically, if the investor is purchasing a residential or not considering a residential property, they will look at monthly rental income, which will answer the question, how many months before I get my money back? If they're considering a commercial property, they'll look at annual expected rental income which will answer the question, how many years before I get my money back? Okay. 
little side note. So let's go back to the appraiser. Three approaches. Sales comparison approach is best for single family home and land. Cost approach is best for special use properties. An income capitalization approach is best for properties that produce an income. The appraiser, when putting their opinion on value on it, on the property, is gonna use as many of the three approaches as what they can. They're not just gonna say one and say, this is my opinion. They can always look at the cost approach. They can always put a value on the land and the structure. If it's not an income producing property, they can't use the income capitalization approach. And once the appraiser studies as many of the three approaches as they can, they do a final reconciliation. Their final reconciliation is a weighted average. They're not just gonna do a simple averaging. The weight is on the approach based on the type of property. So for example, if it's a single family home, the appraisal will do the sales comparison approach. They will do the cost approach, but they're gonna put the more weight on the sales comparison approach. So it's not a simple averaging. They're gonna do a weighted correlation to help them determine which has uh, which approach has the most uh, weight. So now that we've talked about the appraiser's approaches to value, let's go back, hold your place in the book, and let's go back and look at our appraisal again. Now that we know what we know, let's go back to page 442. Four forty-two. this appraiser did the sales comparison approach. You see that black bar on the side, sales comparison approach. They studied the subject property of 123 Colorado Lane. They found three good comps. They made adjustments to the comps to match the subject. Skip over real quick to page 443. There's the cost approach. They use the, about halfway down the page is the cost approach. Right under that is the income capitalization approach, which is blank, which tells us what? This isn't an income producing property. So this property, the appraiser was able to study the sales comparison approach and the cost approach. And then their findings, Back over to page 442, the bottom of page 442 is their reconciliation. There's their opinion. Based on their study, they put a cost to the sales comparison approach of 265, cost approach to 265, 516. And the very last sentence down there is the appraiser's opinion of value, $265,000 as of August 25th. That's the number, that $265,000 is the number that the lender cares about. Remember, the lender is gonna base the loan off of the sales price or the appraised amount, whichever is less. So we get our opinion from the appraiser, the lender and the buyer, their opinion from the appraiser, and that's what the, le the lender is gonna base the loan amount off of. Questions on that? How long does the appraisal last? So the appraisal is only good for today, but we can use it for up to six months. Because think, think about our sales comparison approach. We're studying closed comps, right? So if I do an appraisal today, I may be looking at a comp that closed five and a half months ago. A month from now, that comp's gonna fall off, right? Because if I'm only going back six months. So technically, the appraisal is only good for today. However, the market does fluctuate, but it doesn't change that much in six months. 
So the lender will use it for up to six months. I tell you guys about that short sale I had. We were under contract 11 and a half months. Our appraisal expired. We had to order another appraisal. Ain't that something? Because after six months, the lender said, yeah, this doesn't work anymore. So we had to get a different appraisal because the lender will only take it for up to six months. If anything could have gone wrong and, and, ha and happened in that transaction, I swear. My buyers were mad. Understandably, they said, we already paid for an appraisal. Why do we have to pay for another? Well, it was nobody's fault that it took 11 and a half months. Questions on that? Comments? Anybody ready to go to appraisal school yet? I find this very interesting. This might be my next one day, somewhere down the road. Okay. All right, let's take our last break. When we come back, we're gonna wrap up unit 17, and then we're gonna jump into unit 13.
All right. Take attendance. Your book on page 454 talks about something called an automated valuation method or an AVM. You guys know these better as Zestimates. A Zestimate is an automated valuation method. And let me tell you basically how these work. The AVM pinpoints the subject property and then they use a radius. Let's say, for example, uh, a quarter of a mile. So they pinpoint a radius and then they use a quarter of a mile. It depends on density, how many homes are nearby, how far out they have to go. And the AVM studies all properties that closed within this quarter of a mile radius within the last six months. And that's all they look at what closed in the last six months. They don't look at square footage, type of home, is it a condo? Is it a two story? How many bedrooms? Does it have a fireplace? All they do is say, this is what closed within this radius within the last six months. AVMs are very rarely accurate because I think what we understand now is that we have to take into consideration the type of home. We have to take into consideration, is it a condo or a ranch? How many bedrooms does it have? What's its square footage? I heard an analogy once from an instructor when Zestimates were first under fire. An instructor said, think about a Zestimate. Let's go deep sea fishing. You go out in the boat, you take your net, you drag it on the bottom of the ocean. What you get is what you get. That's your Zestimate. Compare that to a sales comparison approach. Now you're on your boat fishing with bait for a particular type of fish. You're trying to find, you're not just taking what you drag from the bottom of the ocean. Comments on that? You need to be prepared when you're dealing with sellers, especially in this market, buyers as well. This estimate in no way helps us determine <laughs> what a buyer is willing to pay. That's why we have our CMA. That's why we have our research and our knowledge. It takes nothing else into consideration except what closed in the last six months. Comments on that? I have a question. Is, is there mm -hmm. anything that it's good for? I mean, it's risk of sounding sarcastic. But I'm trying to think of a delicate way to answer this. <laughs> you just did. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Zestimates suck, in my opinion, right? Because they don't consider bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage. I don't know why they came to be. I don't know why they're a thing. But I know a seller, especially in this market, they will take that Zestimate to the grave with them. That's why we're here help educate the public. Maybe if you want to use it for a general idea, but I would never use it to look for a property, specifics for a property. Other questions or comments on that? All right, as we said, everything we talked about in unit 17 was our appraiser's hat. We got to act like an appraiser. Uh, the exception to this unit is when we talked about our BPOs and CMAs. The BPO and CMA is what I do. And so since this is my job, the Real Estate Commission, of course, weighs on what they think. 
They have a law, Article 6 of license law is how we conduct ourselves when doing BPOs and CMAs. There's a commission rule. So license law and commission rule. No, you don't need to know these numbers, but you need to know that how we do BPOs and CMAs is done uh, based off a of license law and commission rule. We'll see this again when we get into license law and commission rule in Appendix A. We cannot do a CMA or a BPO for the basis of determining market value. Again, y'all take the word value out of your vocabulary right now. We can also not do a CMA for the purpose of making or originating a loan. That's the appraiser's job to determine, give their opinion of value. That's their appraiser's job to notify the lender what they think their opinion is. Anytime we do a BPO or CMA, the Real Estate Commission says it has to be in writing. Who can remind me what we document? What do we document? Everything. So you're gonna keep all the CMAs you do in your transaction file? Everybody shake your head yes. Non-BPs cannot perform for a fee. So if you're ever called to do a BPO, you can do a BPO, you can give your broker price opinion, but you cannot do it for a fee. Only brokers and broker in charge can do it for a fee. And nobody can charge a fee when we're doing as part of our general brokerage services. Again, doing this CMA for my seller for the listing appointment is just part of my job. I cannot charge an additional fee for that. Doing a CMA for a buyer when they wanna know how much they should offer is just part of my job. And what we report is probable sales price or in property management, probable lease price. Questions about this? We're gonna, again, we'll see this again in license law and commission rule briefly. I do too. So this is probably one of my favorite real estate comics. It's supposed to be a comic, but goodness, isn't this true? Value is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Everybody has a different definition of value. You being the seller have value in it because it's your home. The tax assessor sees cha-ching, 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 don't they? Value is in the eye of the beholder. And that wraps up unit 17. So those key terms on page 433. Key point review, 457 to 458. Student quiz, 459 to 462. Sorry. The math that we talked about is the math for the sales comparison approach, adjusting your comps to match your subject, and then the income capitalization approach, PGI, EGI, net operating income. We're actually going to build on that formula in unit 12. So keep it handy, we'll see it again. Those 50 pages in the back of your book, these are the numbers that relate to the math that we just did. Jot those down and then I'm gonna show you guys what I got for you in Learn Test Pass. I got a good, a good exercise for you guys. Okay, everybody good? You guys have this all written down? 
Okay. So in Learn Test Pass, I have a worksheet for you guys. And unit 17 material. And it's a sales comparison approach worksheet, CSA sales comparison approach. So the worksheet gives you a subject property and it gives you the features of the subject property. So you can study your subject property, learn about your subject property. And then it gives you seven comps, seven comparables. It gives you the facts, the information, the value of a bedroom, bathroom, square foot, et cetera. And then it says, using the above information, find three good comps and determine the range for the probable sales price for the subject property. Now, keep in mind, this is my, your opinion. I'll show you my opinion in just a second. Some comps are gonna be better than others. For example, um, comp five has not closed. It's currently on the market. So comp five isn't gonna be a good cop for the appraiser to use because I don't know what a buyer's willing to pay for it yet. Listing price and sold price are two totally different things. So not all comps are good. There are three, in my opinion, that are better than others. What you wanna look for is closed comps. If it's active or under contract, it doesn't really help me. It helps me know my competition, but it doesn't help me set a price for the subject property because I don't know what a buyer is willing to pay for this yet. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're studying these seven comps and you're saying of these seven comps, which three do I think are the best? Um, I have included my opinion. It's just that. It's my, y'all don't study that. What are you doing? Don't look at that. It's just my opinion. Doesn't do you any good to study mine. It's just something to give you a guide. Again, some comps are better than others. So I think this is a good worksheet to get you um, thinking about your subject property and studying those features of the comp. Remember your hand trick. Subject property never changes. If a comp superior, then to make it match the subject, you deduct. If a comp's inferior, then to make it mat at match your subject, you add. Questions or comments? Okay. Unit 13. Unit 13 is our property insurance basics. Again, whoops. I don't know what's wrong. I'm going to blame my mouse. I'm not going to blame me. I'm going to blame my mouse today. Property insurance basics. Note the word basics. We're not in homeowners insurance agent school, but we need a basic understanding of how homeowners insurance works. So we know when to advise our clients. So I think we're kind of understanding. <laughs> I think we're kind of understanding that a lot of this class, boy, we are teaching you just enough to be dangerous, aren't we? But ultimately, you got to know when to stay in your lane. Let the homeowner's insurance agent do their job. Let the attorney do their job. The lender do their job. So unit 13, we're going to talk about the different types of homeowner's insurance, and we're going to explain some insurance issues. So starting on page 352, unit 13, let's first start defining some words. Insurance is a bilateral contract. How many sides to a bilateral contract? You can show me, I can see your fingers. How many sides to a bilateral contract? Two sides, two parties have duties and obligations to each other. The insurance policy is the agreement between the insurer, who is the insurance company, and the insured, who is the homeowner. The insurer is insuring the insured. Say that five times fast. 
bilateral contract, insurance policies have a definite beginning and a definite end date. How do you renew your insurance policy? You give them some more money. If the buyer is purchasing a home with a loan, homeowner's insurance is required, period, end of story. If it's a cash buyer, homeowner's insurance is highly recommended. But if a lender's involved, they will require homeowner's insurance, protect their interest. The premium is the consumer's cost of coverage, the insured's cost of coverage. Property insurance is also known as casualty insurance. Property insurance protects the insured from damage caused to the property and the permitted improvements. Insurance co companies aren't going to cover unpermitted improvements. Remember, we talked about unpermitted improvements back in Unit 5. And even though I can count an unpermitted improvement in my total heated square footage, I have to disclose that it's on permitted. Why? Because buyers need to know that there's space that is not going to be covered in their new insurance policy. Insurance will only cover permitted improvements. Liability insurance protects the insured from damages caused to or by third parties. Package insurance is a combination of the two. Package insurance combines property insurance and liability insurance. Pages 353-354, there's a list of different insurance policies. We're not going to look at all these. We're just going to pull out a couple. But you got the whole list, 353, 354. The most common policy, the most popular policy is the HO3. The HO3 offers the minimum coverage that the lender requires. The lender doesn't accept just any insurance policy. They have uh, minimum standards. They have things that they do require. And the HO3 policy generally satisfies the lender's requirements. And it provides the insured with the greatest amount of protection. So let's back up for a second. You guys remember when we went under contract? We got our buyer under contract. We did a little mini celebration. And then we immediately sent the contract to the lender and then we send it to the attorney. And we told our buyer, we told our buyer, the longest part of this process is the loan process. So I need you to get the lender whatever they need, whatever they got to do, get it, get the lender so they can get going on their thing, get the appraisal ordered and get this loan through the first round of underwriting. Once your buyer has the lender's initial criteria, once they have those required documents that the lender wants and the lender is satisfied for now, we need to get our buyers shopping for homeowner's insurance. So once we get that first set of documents to the lender, have your buyer stop, start shopping for homeowner's insurance. We need to have them do this while we are still in due diligence. We're going to learn in just a second, not all people or properties are easily insurable. Remember part of your buyer's monthly payment? Remember our PITI, P-I-T-I? 
principal and interest taxes and insurance. If the monthly insurance payment is more than they're approved for, they won't get loan approval. So we need to find out as early on as we can whether or not they can afford homeowner's insurance or not. Make sure the lender approves the policy that they chose. So your buyer shops around, your buyer chooses the policy. Tell them to talk to Jake from State Farm. Tell them to talk to Flo from Progressive. Have them shop around and talk to several and decide which policy is the best for them. And then they send that to the lender for approval. Make sure it's within their approved amount. Make sure they can afford it. Another policy is the HO4 policy. This is renter's insurance. If you have a tenant in place, for example, you're the landlord, you have a tenant in place, you have homeowner's insurance, you protect the structure, your tenant has renter's insurance to protect their stuff, to protect their personal property. The HO4 policy may cover any damage the tenant caused to the, to the property. I'm gonna stress the word may there. So the owner has homeowner's insurance, the tenant has renter's insurance. And then the other one we're gonna talk about is the HO6. This is our condominium owners. Again, condo owners are a little different, right? Because they don't own the structure. There are walls in ownership. Condo owners own from paint to paint or sheetrock to sheetrock. So this covers their personal property, the fixtures, their portion of the property, and any injuries, liability. Questions so far? Defining some more words, a condition is a limitation on coverage. An example of a condition might be vacant properties that I'm getting ready to talk about in just a second. It's a limitation on the coverage. An endorsement is a policy for something not normally covered. Think about something rare or valuable, an antique grandma's jewelry, you may get an endorsement to make sure your antique is covered should something happen. And an exclusion is something that's excluded from the traditional policy. Things that are generally excluded as any coverage due to on any loss due to acts of war or terrorism. Property damage due to acts of war or terrorism are generally not covered, they're excluded. So when your buyer starts shopping around for homeowner's insurance. The homeowner's insurance agent needs to determine what their premium is going to be, what their cost of coverage is going to be. And not all people and not all property are easily insurable. And one thing that the homeowner's insurance agent will pull is something called a clue report. CLU stands for Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange. It's a claims database. They look at the person's claims history over the last seven years. They look at the property's claims history 
over the past seven years. And if the person or the property have a consistent history of making claims, they're gonna have higher policies. They're gonna have higher rates. So anytime a claim is made, it goes into this clue report. Insurance agents have this database. Not all insurance policies are created equal. vacant property and unoccupied property. Give you a little history lesson real quick. Many, many, many years ago, when pre-licensing first came to this state, many of us were not around when this happened. Insurance used to be covered in pre-licensing. And at some point they dropped it. They said, brokers don't need to know insurance. That's the job of the homeowner's insurance agent. Probably about three or four years ago, they added insurance back to pre-licensing. And it's of my opinion that this slide is the reason why they added it back. In practice, in the real world, it's of my opinion that this is the slide why we have insurance back in pre-licensing. Listing agents. At some point before settlement, your seller has to move out. And if they're moving out weeks or months before settlement, we need to encourage our sellers to report to their insurance agent that the home is vacant. Will their premiums go up? Yes. But here's the deal. Failure to report the home is vacant. If something happens to the property, insurance won't cover it. The truth is vacant homes are at higher risk for damage, for vandalism. And if your seller doesn't report it as vacant, the home gets damaged, insurance may not cover them because insurance didn't know that it was vacant. You guys hear on the news every once in a while, somebody breaks into a vacant home and steals the copper wiring. I cannot make anybody do anything. All I can do is suggest. All I can do is advise. Your seller tells you you're moving out three weeks before settlement. Have a little flag that goes up that says, ooh, you should call your insurance agent company and let them know that the home's going to be vacant. If you have this conversation with your seller face-to-face, -face, it's advised you follow up with an email or a text. Because what do we document? Everything. So you go home, you pound out an email per our conversation. Again, I can't make them do anything. They're not gonna be happy about paying more money. I promise you, they're not gonna be happy about their rates going up for those three weeks. They're gonna be less happy if the home is damaged and they find out that their insurance company isn't gonna cover it. Unoccupied homes could also be a threat. They need to be reported. Policy may or may not go up. Unoccupied home, the stuff is still there. Most of the time, the sellers are gonna move out and vacate the property though. Do you have any questions on this? Important conversations to have with your seller. Another important conversation to have with your seller, and another reason why I think we have insurance back in pre-licensing, 
we need to explain to the seller that the risk of loss is on the seller. If something happens to the property while we're under contract, it's still the seller's property. The seller needs to keep homeowner's insurance until we close. If closing is delayed, they need to extend that policy for another day or another week. Guys, if the house burns down when we're under contract, the risk of loss is on the seller. So many times in my career, we've gone under contract and the seller says, can I cancel my homeowner's insurance? No, it's still your property. If the house burns down while we're under contract, the buyer has choices. They may terminate. We're going to look at that in just a second. In your book on page 356, near the bottom, do you see the risk of loss provision? 356, risk of loss, cross that out. That's no longer current. The current is always in the forms in Learn Test Pass. So they've updated it since this book was printed. So what we're gonna do is take a pause. We're gonna go into Learn Test Pass. We're gonna go back up to the Unit 10 material and we're gonna look at our offer to purchase and contract. And the risk of loss provision The current will always be in learn test pass. The risk of loss provision says the risk of loss or damage by fire or other casualty prior to closing shall be upon who? The seller. Sellers advised not to cancel existing insurance on the property until after confirming recordation of the deed. Then it goes on to say buyer's obligation to complete this transaction shall be contingent upon the property being in substantially the same or better condition at closing as on the date of this offer, reasonable wear and tear expected. If the property is not in the same or better condition, buyer may terminate this contract by written notice delivered to the seller and the buyer will get their earnest money back. I don't care if we're inside or outside of due diligence. House burns down, buyer chooses to terminate, they're gonna get their earnest money. Does that say due diligence fee? That just says earnest money. So if house, burns, house burns down, buyer chooses to terminate, we'll get them their earnest money back. If the property is not in the same condition and buyer does not elect to terminate, Buyer shall be entitled to receive, in addition to the property, the proceeds of any insurance claim filed by the seller. So if the house burns down when we're under contract, the buyer has a choice, don't they? They either terminate and get their earnest money, or they proceed and buy the property. And once the seller gets their insurance claim, the buyer will get it so they can rebuild. If I were a buyer's agent and the house that my buyer had under contract burned down and my buyer looked at me and said, oh my God, what should I do? I'm going to advise my buyer to talk to their attorney. And I'm also going to advise my buyer to talk to the seller's insurance company before they make a decision. I don't think it's a secret the insurance companies aren't known for rapid payouts. It's gonna take a while <laughs> to get this process for the seller to get their claim. I can't make this decision for the buyer. That is up to the buyer to decide. It would come down to location, 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 wouldn't it? What would make a buyer do this? Because they really, really want to live here. 
But again, I can't make that decision for them. Questions on that, comments? Understand too, a question came in, why does the buyer not get the due diligence back? I don't know. I don't know why um, the North Carolina Association of Realtors and the North Carolina Bar Association didn't decide that they should. I mean, that's a really good question. I agree. You think that they would, but what does the contract say? The contract says they get their earnest money back. I agree, Christina. We'll probably see that change, I would imagine. Contract updates about once a year. I just got an email of the other day that the proposals on the table for the changes in the contract, and if approved, they'll go into effect July 1st. So remember what I say, the only thing consistent in this industry is change, and that includes the forms that we use. MTG. Oh, how would the mortgage work with the insurance claim? That may be another call you want to have your buyer make is to their lender. Because we're still going on to closing, right? They're still going on to closing. They're just going to get the seller's proceeds after we close. So yeah, we definitely want to, that's another phone call for your buyer to make before they make a decision. The important thing to know is that I can't make that decision for them. I give them their options. They make the decision. On the day of settlement, the property is gonna be doubly insured. On the day of settlement and closing, the seller's policy is ending and the buyer's policy is beginning. My gut tells me if the house burns down on the day of settlement, it's gonna come down to the, day, the time that the deed was recorded. Who owned the property when the house burned down on the day of settlement? Questions on that? So we need to encourage the property owner, talk to their insurance agent. They're gonna leave the property vacant or un unoccupied. Yes, their rates will go up, but make them understand they won't be covered if they don't notify the insurance company. And your seller has to maintain coverage through the day of closing. If closing gets delayed, they have to extend their policy. Don't cancel it until it's a done deal. And when is it a done deal? When that brand new deed is recorded, then and only then is it a done deal. Questions or comments? Does this apply if you go on a vacation for a couple months? That's the difference in vacant, non-occupied. If you go on vacation, your stuff is still there. I mean, if you're going to go sail the world and you're going to be gone for six months, you may want to notify your insurance company that it'll be unoccupied for six months just so it's covered. I have an uncle. We call him a snowbird. He lives in Pennsylvania six months out of the year and Florida six months out of the year. Not a terrible way to spend your retirement years, if you ask me. So in the wintertime, he's in Florida. In the summertime, he's in Pennsylvania, which means he has a property that's unoccupied. His insurance company knows when he's in Florida, when he's in Pennsylvania. We've talked about possession of the property. Possession typically happens when the deed records. 
typically the buyer shouldn't be given access, keys, garage door openers, gate codes. They should not be given access until the deed records. We talked about some um, alternatives. We looked at our addenda, buyer possession before closing, seller possession after closing. If the parties agree to either one of these situations, in either scenario, either the buyer moves in before the deed is recorded or the seller stays after the deed is recorded. Either scenario, one party is the homeowner and needs to have homeowner's insurance. The other party is the tenant and they need renter's insurance. And our agenda for both, buyer possession before closing or seller possession after closing, our agenda for both address this. If you own the property, you need homeowner's insurance. If you're renting it, you need tenant's insurance. Questions? We've talked several times about flood hazards, flood insurance. Flood insurance is above and beyond homeowner's insurance. Flood insurance is regulated by FEMA. FEMA is our Federal Emergency Management Agency. Each homeowner's insurance agent sets their own rates, has their own policies for homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance is not created equally. FEMA dictates the rates if flood insurance is required. You can't shop around for flood insurance. FEMA does more than just charge insurance if it's in a flood hazard. FEMA may work with the community to help reduce the impact of flooding. If the property, specifically the structure, has been designated as a flood hazard. FEMA kind of use this algorithm. They look at several different um, factors to determine how much the insurance company should charge for flood insurance. Now this is math we don't have to do. There's good news, right? Look with me, if you will, the top of page 358. Things that FEMA considers when determining how much to tell the insurance agent to charge for flood insurance, what's the year of the building, uh, the number of floors, location, where is the structure in relation to the flood hazard? So these are the things that they use to calculate, again, how much flood insurance is charged is not up to the insurance agent. So they can shop around for a homeowner's insurance policy, but if they're in a flood zone, that comes from FEMA. And it is included in their flood home. And again, if they're close to their maximum PITI and you tack on flood insurance, it could set them over their approved amount and they won't get loan approval. I always look at the FEMA map before I write up an offer for my buyer. You can go to FEMA's website. We're gonna look at a map in just a second. Please don't go to FEMA's website right now. You can wait 10 more minutes and go then. But I always try to look at this flood map before I write up an offer for my buyer because I wanna know if we have to take this into consideration or not, especially a buyer that's awfully close to the max that they're allowed, their maximum monthly payment. Because flood insurance is not cheap. 
Um, again, FEMA may have restrictions on the location. Where is the structure in relation to the flood hazard? The type of improvement, is it residential? Is it commercial? And the elevation, how far up does it sit? Anytime you have a property near a body of water, think about if we have a flash flood come through, that creek turns into this rushing river. So the FEMA map kind of looks something like this. Um, this slide makes me sad because I do, I miss being face to face with you guys. I really do. So when we look at this map, back in the day, we were here. This was our location. For my Winston people to get your bearings, this is Stratford Road and this is Knollwood. So for my Winston people, Starbucks, or not Starbucks, Chick-fil-A is right there. Everybody with me? When you come across, this is 421, what's known as um, uh, Salem Parkway today. Back in here, you have a bunch of residential neighborhood streets. Right here is a creek. And you can see those properties, this area that is around the creek is considered in a flood hazard, a flood zone. FEMA uses a 100-year floodplain. The 100-year floodplain, the name is very deceiving. This does not mean it's going to flood once every 100 years. This means if the property is in a 100-year floodplain, it means there's a 1% chance annually that it could flood. If you're in a 100-year floodplain, there's a 1% chance each year you could have a flood. Flood maps change. When we have a big storm come through areas that have never flooded before, flood now, and now they're in the 100 year floodplain because now they have a 1% chance of flooding. Flood maps change on the regular. When it comes to flood insurance, flood hazards, our responsibility, help find flood zones. When you're listing a property, if your seller is in a flood zone and your seller has to pay flood insurance, that's a material fact, listing agents have to disclose that. But we also need to be on the lookout for signs of possible flooding. What are signs of possible flooding? Nearby water, creeks, streams, rivers, lakes, ponds. Not all properties in a flood zone have to pay flood insurance. It just depends. For example, I had a listing a couple years ago and the property was on a cul-de-sac. Right, so there's our cul-de-sac. And it was a subdivision, it was really unique. The best I can figure is that my homeowner, every other lot in this neighborhood was like on a quarter of an acre or a third of an acre. My guys were sitting on five acres. The only thing I can figure is that whatever land was left after they, mine, mine was the last one built, <laughs> whatever land was left, they said, I'll just give it to them. So the home was right here on the cul-de-sac, but the property expanded up. I mean, it was huge. It went like way up here. Everybody else had a quarter acre. My guys had five. And up at the very top of the property was a creek. And because the creek was up there, it was considered a flood hazard. That area was considered a flood hazard. But because the structure was so far away, my guys weren't required to pay flood insurance. 
So I disclosed that. Part of the property is in a flood hazard. Owners are not required to pay flood insurance. And I got a lot of phone calls from buyer's agents, as I should have, verifying that they're not required to pay flood insurance. It's in a flood zone, but they don't have to pay flood insurance. That's correct. So again, just because a portion of the property is in a flood zone doesn't mean that they have to pay flood insurance. The best we can do is help educate and advise our buyers. So again, our responsibility when it comes to insurance, we need to have the discussion with our seller to keep coverage until it closes. Don't drop coverage until it closes. Keep the homeowner's insurance policy. And we need to have our buyers secure their new policy while we're still in due diligence to get lender approval and to make sure the lender says that they can afford it. As a buyer's agent, worst case scenario, if we have to terminate, the best I can do is terminate within due diligence and get my buyer their earnest money back. It's better than nothing. When I woke up this morning, I had a goal to get through unit 13. Key terms on page 351. Don't go anywhere yet. We're not done. I got like four more minutes worth of three more minutes worth of something to say. <laughs> Key point review on 359 to 360. Student quiz. 361. Questions on unit 13. Is anybody a homeowner's insurance agent? Is anybody already an agent? Every once in a while I get one in pre like Hang on, I'm going to my other screen. What, oh, good, good, good. Okay, everybody good? Unit 13, that's a wrap. All right, let's talk about what next week's gonna look like and then I wanna share something with you guys because I'm starting to get lots of questions about your test. Um, we still got a couple weeks worth of material. Um, next week, we're gonna do units 11 and 12. We'll probably get started on unit 19. We'll get most of the way through 11 and 12 and well into 19. So um, I ask that you look ahead. Unit 11 is our landlord tenant relationship. Unit 12 is property management. Unit 19 is our fair housing unit. Unit 19 is not just very important for your test, but it's important for real life. If you want to get yourself in trouble really, really fast, violate fair housing. So it's important that we understand the protected classes and the things that we need to do to stay in compliance with fair housing. So we'll get into unit 19 next week, 11, 12, and 19. I'm getting questions about the test, we got, what, two weeks from Tuesday, so we're getting there. We still got some time, but I just want to point out and learn test pass at the very bottom. There's a 100% exam and additional resources. There's comprehensive exams. Now, we haven't covered everything yet, so you may not do so well on the stuff that we haven't covered, but you can start looking at this. Um, there's an end of course review. You want to know what's going to be on my end of class exam? Here you go. This is test one and the retake. Please don't call me and say, Julie, what does this word mean? This is here. It means a lot more to you if you look it up. So you guys can start thinking about where we're gonna be in a few weeks. You got some things in the 100% and learn test pass to help you prepare, help you get ready. Remember, I'm always around to answer questions. Let me know if I can help in any way. 
Um, question came in. Oh, no, I hate it when you think like this. How can I retake the class if I fail? Um, Lane will let you retake for $175. So if you don't pass my end of class exam, you got to keep going until you get that certificate of completion. The good news is Lane will let you retake the class for $175. But let's not think that way just yet, huh? Let's think about when I pass. Then we'll cross the other bridge later when we get there. Fair enough? Power of the mind, power of positive thinking when I pass. Learn test pass, I don't know a better tool. I don't know a better tool that we have for you guys than learn test pass. If you've not utilized it. My last class, you guys, I got an email from a student the day before the exam. How do I access learn test pass? What I really wanted to say was why? I didn't. I was kind. <laughs> Y'all don't be that person. Seriously, if you guys can't get in, if you're not in, if you can't get in, no judgment. I'd rather you reach out to me now than the day before the exam. Fair enough. If you're not in Learn Test Pass, if you're not using it, I need to hear from you this weekend so we can get you in. No, the retest is included. I'm talking about retaking the class. If you don't pass the test, if you don't pass the retake, Questions, comments, concerns? I'll stay on for a minute. It's 1.00, so thank you guys for your, for your time. Everybody have a good weekend, and we'll see you guys on Tuesday at 9 a.m.